You know, when you got off the plane, when we arrived in Paramaribo, it was kind of weird because you get on the plane at Heathrow, which is one of the biggest, busiest airports on the planet, and then you get off the plane at Paramaribo and it's like a shed, basically. That's it, you know, the customs is extremely, well, it's different, put it that way. Well, the nerves of the crew, to be honest, in the build up to it, I, I'd never seen so many grown men overestimate what they, they honestly thought they were all gonna get eaten by crocodiles, they're writing wheels. I mean, Nick Warner, the director, he's got two twin girls. He literally thought they're like gonna be, you know, like dadless. I've done wheels for everything, mate. I'm covered, I'm covered, I'm going down. You deserve to go down. Cheers, Look mate. at it, it, this is it, honestly, this is like he's going to his death. But I think they've got it all in hand. Um, probably no, fans back home would like me to die, yeah. but they'd like the rest preserved. Or we'll cop a load of this. Here we go. This is the uh, mouth of the Coppernam River that's going to take us down into the centre of Suriname. This is the uh, the boys just loading up. Let's get up here. It's hard for me to comment on the other people because I'm genuinely excited about going um, going on the river. Um, you know, I've, I've kept this look because this, this, this is me, this is my attitude to it all, yeah? This is my attitude to it all, like this. The crew, <laughs> that's their attitude to it. It's, it's real, isn't it? It's all real. I don't know whether this is for real. Hello, sir. I've never seen so many grown men f***ing themselves. Take the photograph. <laughs> Welcome to the Amazon. Here we go, on the boat. Alright, Bobs. There they are. Where are you going, Smithy, Dino? That's us. Five hours on this. Come back to us in four and a half hours. <laughs> no smile. <laughs> How am I doing that? How am I doing this? So I arrived in Donda's camp and uh, it was like a scene out of Apocalypto. Um, High-fived a few of the locals, looked at my phone, got 4G. 3G, five bars. Kurt, did you say... We'd literally been in Donda's camp about three minutes and Ali was straight on his phone seeing if he could do a Facebook Live. Um, and the ridiculous thing was, he actually started getting 3G. So Ali being Ali, we're in the middle of the jungle, 100 miles from any civilization or proper civilization. But he kept pointing at this big lump of wood that just kept coming out of the ground. And that's where he thought the 3G was coming from. Where actually, there was a massive great pole with all of the bits and bobs coming off of it, miles behind where we was. but. It was quite funny. Mate, mate, I can't believe it. Actually got, we've actually got 3G in the middle of this. We've just got to the camp and we've got 3G. <laughs> I was ready to FaceTime. That was it, mum, the missus. I was just, it was all about FaceTime and I couldn't believe it. Here I was in the middle of the Amazon basin, yeah? Little town, well you can't even call it a town. You couldn't even call it a village. Wouldn't even qualify as a village. Donda's camp, which was the first one that we actually went to after a five hour boat ride through the jungle, which I've got to say, was a lot more advanced than what I was expecting. You know, the huts were really sturdy, they were completely waterproof. All right, on camera, they looked sort of, you know, a, you know, a long way back in time, um, but the camp was massive. I mean, there was three or four huts that we used, and then we had this massive great pontoon that um, Ali, myself, and the two guys actually slept on, which, had a couple of massive, and by massive, I mean spiders on it, you know, right? <laughs> which, which is always a little bit disconcerting. But the fact of the matter is, when you actually walk past the huts that we were using for the crew to stay in and for our sort of cooking shed, if you like, there was, there was like proper apartments 
proper little bungalows for probably 200 yards. There was a football pitch. No, I thought it was pretty cool, actually. Do you know, when we actually arrived, I thought the crew were going to be, um, I thought the crew were going to be worse than us, actually. I thought they were going to be prima donnas, you know, like, oh my God, it's too hot for this, too hot for that. But actually, you know, everyone seemed really chilled out and really relaxed. And I think the excitement was right the way through the entire camp. One of the things I've learned is when you're filming with boats, it's pure ag when you're filming with boats. People don't realise it's much harder filming than it is fishing. Nick, I thought you wanted me to do it when you've done something well, and now you're talking all over it. So when we're out in them boats, we've got to join the boats together. You've got one with the cameras on as well, which are supposed to get the details. So it's a nightmare. There's a lot of disturbance setting them scenes up. Um, which really stresses me out because I'm caught in the middle here. I'm the angler, I'm the executive producer. I've pretty much organised half of the shoot along with Gary who helps me a lot. And all the crew are worried about really is, are they getting their shot? All I'm worried about is, are we going to make a great show, catch plenty of fish to impress you lot at home? And a second challenge, the peacock bass challenge, I still stand by it. Like, if we were roving, it'd be so much more fun like going all nooks and crannies, but we can't, we have to stay in one position. And you ask any lure angler, do they stand in one swim, cast in to the same bush all day long? Who likes to smash the same bush all day long? When you're filming from a boat, it's always really difficult because you can't just literally whiz up to your spot and get your rods out. You've got to wait for the crew boat basically to circle you several times to get your location set for the scene and all that stuff before you can actually go out and lower your rods and then the crew have got to film that. I always say to people, fish caught off camera just don't count. You can't literally just turn up to a spot and I'm standing there with a peacock bass holding it up and then tell the story because that makes for a pretty poor fishing show. Um, so it takes a lot of patience on the angler's part and it takes a lot of patience on the crew's part as well. But I always have this perspective when I'm filming that it's not my fishing time. So whatever needs to be done for the show, we do. Once we get fishing, then brilliant. Once the green light's been given to me basically, then we can do everything we possibly can. Being in that first camp, wasn't really like what we expected of the Amazon. I weren't expecting phone signal. I told my missus I wouldn't be talking to her for a couple of weeks. You know, we had a satellite phone, you know, proper like Pablo Escobar stuff. You know, eh, you got the shipment, yeah, like, dig it, dig. But it was like that. Move camp. No, we here we are, jungle camp. Look at that. Here we have, uh, here's Andy. Say hello, Andy. Uh, yeah. How are you, man? All good. So we've got to go behind here. Here we go. Look at this. Not been used yet. Totally clean. Look at that. Here we go. Tents are going up. We are actually going to be staying on a pontoon out there, me and the crew. Okay, so there we go. The building of the jungle camp. We were in tents, we weren't on a boat anymore, sleeping on a punt. Me and Bobby were sharing, lovely that. Really bonded. I kept singing Candle in the Wind to him every morning. Like a candle in the wind. We were properly in the jungle then. When we arrived in the second camp, down on the Copenhagen, where we actually targeted the Piriba, that's where it started getting real, you know? I mean, on a couple of occasions, the clouds rolled in and you thought we was gonna get some sort of tropical rainstorm, and we literally, all we had was like, lumps of tree that were just like tied together with tarpaulin over the top. Um, however, ironically, we went into there, and it's literally just this hole cut out into the jungle. When the drone goes up above the camp, all you can see is hundreds and hundreds of miles of trees. There's, there's literally, I mean, Donda's camp was extremely advanced, this thing had an upside down bucket with a hole in it. There was no showers. You had to literally just take a bucket of water out of the river and pour it over your head. You know, there was, you know, there was nowhere. To, I mean, there was a tiny little hole for a wee and there was a tiny hole for a poo. All right, and then I don't know where it went every day. I didn't ask the questions, but it disappeared halfway through the day while we was filming. So some poor sod had to get rid of it. All right, definitely weren't my sort of cup of tea. Um, but that's, that's what I expected right away from the start. And yeah, I was proper buzzing when I was in there.
obviously going all that way, you, you know, you want to catch the big fish and, um, you know, you needed to be there night and day and obviously we, we had to split the crew. So the, 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 I call it the wimpy crew would go back in daylight, but then my man, Scott, the Trojan, would stay out. This is man's fishing now. This is like right, Champions League final. This is it. This is you, Bob. We finished fishing one evening. I said, come on, let's have a little, let's have our own little wildlife safari, go and have a look. Hello, Rob. What cool little dude. Just like chilling. So we're all shining torches in the trees as we go back. You'd be going back, just trees, 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 and it's mad. You see a tiny couple of orange eyes look back at you. It, like, it could be like 400 yards away and you'll see these eyes. And then we're pulling up and uh, Dave, Lionel Richie, I called him. He'd go and try to get the snake so we could have a look at it. And uh, he caught a smelly, smelly boa constrictor. And uh, that, was, that was wicked. Right, what does anyone think? Do they think this man caught the snake? Caused hey, Limon. Limon. <laughs> yeah, caught the snake, Limon. <laughs> <laughs> he caught it. We had a caiman with a fishing rod. Went to eat my fishing rod. <laughs> I was trying to imitate it, making the noise of a fish on the surface, and it come right out. And uh, Dave said, Lionel Richie said, it'll eat, your, it'll eat your rod if you're not careful. It'll snap it in two. So uh, I carried on doing it. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But then that night, we got so excited as a little team on that boat. Me, Bobby, Bobby loved all that stuff. Scott, Scott the cameraman loved it all. And uh, even Lionel Richie had got bang into it all night long. Like we were going at it all night long, looking for stuff. Goes to start the boat up. Run out of fuel. <laughs> run out of fuel. <laughs> <laughs> Can they run out? With the feather, with the run baby feather. We run out of fuel. Actually, run out. of Glad you enjoying it, Bob. Well, I'm a guest, mate. I can't do this work. And the safety boat had left us, had gone, thinking we we're all right. We we're just having a look at fuel against the tide. We've run out of fuel. One oar we had. Yeah, and I ain't talking about the type that come out at night. Yeah, we had one rowing oar. So I pulled my seat up, pulled it off. That was my oar. There we are, all broken down. I've now got a seat and finally Bobby Zamora realises that it's not I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. He needs to man up and get on the game. Ah, uh, this is so amateur, right? This whole two, last 24, 48 hours for me has just been a joke. Uh, Am I, uh, what are you, what are you saying, At least we're close to shore, bruv. What sort of captain have I got? We've run out of fuel! So Bobby no. finally gives up his seat, rips it off, and somewhere Bobby finds a brolly. We had a brolly in there still. And then Scott the cameraman gives him some tape, and before we know it, we've got a brolly taped to a seat. What have you got, ladies and gentlemen? You've got yourself an oar. Amazing. Bobby, brolly oar. Crazy stuff. Look who's here. Look who's here. Come, it's an Amazonian tribesman. I just, I just heard you telling a story about... This is, not, this is not set up. He's actually come for lunch today because ever since the Amazon, there's like a deep, deep bond. Mm. He's left his wife for me. <laughs> 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 but listen, I was telling them about the awe. Oh, it's unbelievable. What an experience that was. Man, do you know what the, you know, I was thinking about it? How about the tide going the wrong way and all? So the tide, it's all about the seat. It's all about the seat. The seat, the seat. It's all about the seat. The seat. Boys, we've been rowing miles. Yeah. Like, oi, 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 oi. Feature link, film about this. Feature link, isn't Fe it? <laughs> We're rich. <laughs> We're rich. <laughs> We're rich.
When you go to a location like Suriname, there's just so many fish that you could go after um, and you can't cover them all in the show. You've got like three challenges. There's all weird and wonderful creatures. One of the most weird and wonderful was the electric eel. Show it, pop his head up, pop his head up. <laughs> oh, 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 oh no. Never caught one before. Got to an area, there all the bubbles were popping up. Thought, oh, we'll have a go for these. Then we hooked one. Do you want it to touch the boat? Yeah. Hummy <laughs> <laughs> dear. Bob, look okay, at that. Just get your hands up. Just get your hands up. Take it out. But then you've got the problem of unhooking one. And uh, Bobby was not liking the thought of it. I was obviously not liking the thought of it. Um, good job we weren't using metal line, otherwise we would have both been fried. Um, so obviously we got our mate Div to come to the, <laughs> to the rescue. Um, he had it on lockdown, just a bit of a towel, wraps it round and unhooks them. But they are absolutely massive, but they don't really fight that long. They go a little bit mad, they almost don't know their hooks. And they're just little mouths, full of electricity. Man. Electric kill. Electrifying. <laughs> Not many, not many people caught them. <laughs> <laughs> Little shout out here to my mate Kurt, the chef. Um, as a treat, after doing such a great job in England, I decided to take Kurt to the jungle um, as our chef and help out. He absolutely loved it. So I decided on the final night, um, before we left, he'd heard all the great stories of us out at sea or on the river. Uh, <laughs> and he wanted a piece of the action. So I took him fishing for a pariba. What have you learned tonight? Small fish, small hooks. Scale down your tackle. This is it. Look, we're finally up to Lao Lao, but it's about eight pounds. <laughs> you need to go and get bigger, mate. That's what you need to do. To do like... Don't lose it now, I'm Kurt. Gonna... All right, Where's Kurt. Where's the Say well done. Well done, Harry. Well you done, Kurt. It. <laughs> We come all the way to Suriname for the Pariba catfish or the Lao Lao and um, you won't know why I'm telling you this. There's a, a small clue in the trailer of the Big Fish Off and there'll be one in the, in the show trailer as well. But the man I have to credit mainly with this capture is my co-presenter, Dean Macy. Because if something hadn't happened to Dean, I wouldn't have been fishing that evening. And we hadn't caught any Pariba at this stage. So I went out and caught one. Yes. Downtime, innit? Pariba time. And wow, them things, when they're under the rod tip, um, and we'd broken the reel, one of the reels we had was broken. We'd broken it on the way out. I don't know what had happened. I mean, the Salt Eagers by um, Dyer are so resilient. It's not in a competition, so it doesn't matter if it comes off. I'll just be gutted. Oh, I'm done again. Yeah. Oh, oh. That real. But this one had something had happened to it, and it was like, it was like, it was like backwinding when it's not supposed to. Like, you know, a multiplier is not supposed to backwind, and the fight was crazy. But I sort of worked it out. It was almost good because it prepped us for the real fishing. Oh, this is heavy. Good fish. Yeah, mate. It feels well. I don't think it's a. Couple load of that. Oi, hold the. Oh, that's it. That's it. Oh, 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 oh. I need to a little bit, a little, little bit, bit of line. A little bit. Oh. <laughs> whoa, whoa! <laughs> that is powerful! <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> 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 your pants down. They're strong, aren't they, gal? <laughs> you shit your pants yeah. down. Yeah! <laughs> That is strong, man. Oh, Whoa. oh, God. <laughs> yeah, what a fight. And when that comes up, and uh, it was just an evening, perfect, you know, that was, I felt that was God's way of giving me a little pat on the back, saying, okay, mate, you've had a hard series. You've tried hard. Well done for taking part. Here's a Pariba. <laughs> Oh! How big is that? How big is it? 100 pounds? Yeah? yeah. No, no. yeah, yeah? Actually, yeah. Oh! <laughs>
Bash me. <laughs> Look at that. I didn't really care how big how big this fish was going to be when I was fighting it. It felt massive though because I've I've um, without sounding big headed, I've had quite a few fish over 100 pounds across the world, both sea and uh, still water. Gary Newman turned up, who's the man who helped so much with this project um, in planning it, and he's fished there loads, caught loads of the things. I don't know, hundreds of them probably, and he um, he went that's over 100, it's about 110. Um, and yeah, I was ecstatic. To be honest, I wouldn't have cared if it was 35 pounds. I just wanted to catch a lao lao, a big, a big-ish one. Um, so to catch a triple figure one, yeah, lovely achievement. I was buzzing. It, 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 um, it sort of put the cherry on the cake of the trip before the cake had been made. Every single given chance that Ali and myself had to get out after the after the filming to finish, basically. Flicked the rods out, came back about 50 yards upstream and sat there and I've got a lovely picture that Nick took about five minutes before one of the rods rocked off. Jesus Christ! When your name's on it, your name's on it! <laughs> oh, there goes one <laughs> so Hitler only had one, he, did, he conquered a lot. Yo! Alley that's, up there. that's a media about 800 yards upstream. The, the Piriba is one of the fish that I desperately wanted to travel somewhere around the world to catch because they are the they are arguably the most awesome looking cats out of all of them. If that's its tail, its head's up here, that could be big one. Oh, yeah, that's a big That's big one. Holy That's a beast. That's a beast. I only had my phone with me because with 45 minutes of fishing to go, I genuinely didn't think we was going to catch. So I had this massive, great, eight foot odd catfish laying on the boat. Yeah, you can't make, you can't even lift right, hang it. On, hang on. Come this side, come inside. No, there. it's all right, I'm stopping yeah. you from sliding, yeah. Yeah. All right, ready? Uh, tail down, we're now tail down. It's big 150. Uh, hang on. Uh, hang on, Dean. Uh, Keep going, mate. Okay. Yes. You can't hold it. One more, mate. One okay. more. And Ali, who was 800 yards upstream, came boating down and done as good a photo as, as anyone could in the dark, on a boat, rocking down the cop and arm, right, on what I've got is a pretty old phone. So, uh, yeah, 160 pound pier either. So for, for an epic show and a great experience to have less than a day and catch a wicked peacock bass, a wicked electric eel, and a fish of a lifetime in 160 pound Piriva is ridiculous in the box for me. Didn't need to stay on them extra two days. Ah! <laughs> 90 minutes! <laughs> oh dear! So you need 90 minutes to go broke Know what though, when we've sort of sat here and, and reflected on what can only be described as an incredible two weeks. Um, TV, an hour of telly can't do that trip justice. Um, the things we saw, the things we did, this little mini documentary is hopefully giving you a glimpse of it. The show will give you the entertaining elements, um, but wow, what a trip. Don't miss this show, it is probably the best TV show we've ever made. That's what Nick the director said anyway. I'll let you be the judge of that.